Well, friends, hello, everyone. I understand that we are live, which means today you will learn about a new investment project from Solar Group, the next generation airship. Today, the webinar will be hosted by me, Pavel Filipov, the head of advertising and public relations at Solar Group, and of course, Fedor Konstantinov, who is the project manager for the next generation airship. And before we begin, I ask you to please kindly like this broadcast right now and share it. I constantly talk about this because it is extremely important. It is crucial for as many people as possible to learn about our project and join it. Right now, take a moment to share and like this post on the social network where you are watching us. The main broadcast takes place on Vcontacted, where we will primarily monitor questions, as well as on YouTube, on the official channel of the Next Generation Airship Project, on the Solar Group channel. Be sure to subscribe everywhere so you don't miss the upcoming broadcasts. I am telling you that we need as many viewers as possible so that more people learn about our project, and we are confident that this will happen. I am sure that there will be hundreds of thousands of people at these webinars. After we present this project to you, because we do not yet have a completely ready official website, there is still much to be done in terms of packaging the project itself. You will only learn about it from this webinar, so you are very lucky to be here, because right now, as we have just started, we are preparing the project. We are in the pre-launch phase with super interesting investment conditions that you can take advantage of today. So you are fortunate to be here. I suggest we get straight to the point. What is this project about? Next generation airships. Are we really planning to revive airships in Russia and perhaps even in the world? I would say yes, because there are companies in the world that are trying to make airships and some are even producing them. But I am confident that our team is stronger and we will definitely surpass them. And Solar Group. Solar Group had been looking for a project to engage in, aside from the company Sovolmash, and Fedor Konstantinov was specifically responsible for this direction. He communicated with a large number of various inventors, universities, and engineering teams that proposed a wide range of directions to pursue. But still, we chose to focus on airships. And I would like to ask Fedor a question here to start our presentation. Fedor, can you tell us why airships? Hello, everyone, everyone. Pavel, hello. Pavel, why airships? After all, after all, because this is definitely the coolest, most extensive and broadest technology. As we mentioned, we are looking for technologies, airship technology, logistics technology, and aviation technology. This is truly the most extensive thing we have found and in a fairly complete packaged form. I will explain now. Various developers have come. I have a development that I theoretically calculated at some point, but I haven't conducted any experiments yet. It's really just a theory, a fantasy, and mathematics, which is already a good start. People have come with semi-finished products. And some have come with a finished single product, but that was, for example, something completely new. I have already mentioned this, but I will tell you again. A developer came to us regarding oil cracking. So there are now factories that perform oil cracking. Roughly speaking, they pour a huge pool of oil where there is a special technological process, temperature, evaporations, and so on. There is a huge factory that processes oil into various light fractions including gasoline, kerosene, and others. He had a development. Yes, it was theoretical, and he already had a physical version, but implementing it, where everything is already occupied, where large factories and enterprises are operating, and altering the technological processes from our side would mean entering into fierce competition. By the way, we also invited this person to a couple of webinars and they spoke at one conference. It was seen just from Gazprom and in collaboration with the Gubkin Oil and Gas Institute. They took him in, assigned him some positions and salaries. They said, that's it, we have heard you. He used to come by and knock on the door. In general, he was taken away 
and that's good because we would have had to deal with a big machine and there were such cases. In the case of airships, they have been flying for a long time, even a hundred years ago, comfortably across the Atlantic Ocean. They have flown in modern history in modern Russia, and they were also built in the Soviet Union. In modern Russia, they were built in the 90s and in the 2000s. There is a whole engineering team that has been working on this. All theoretical developments, technological processes, designs, and so on are in place. The airship does not compete with anyone. Conditionally, the aviation industry will be somewhat shocked by their appearance, but it will also benefit them. They have an operating company that deals with airplanes, helicopters, and cargo transportation, and they will simply have another aircraft with unique characteristics. It doesn't engage in warfare like you would expect, as this radio cracking installation I mentioned earlier was quite small about the size of a tank car used for transporting goods. You place it directly on the well, and it uses electromagnetic microwave fields and accelerated electrons to break down molecules. Essentially, you adjust the accelerating parameters of these beams, and at the output, you get a ready-made composition for any purpose straight from the well, whether it's high-octane gasoline or even higher. In general, this would eliminate the need for these factories. However, airships do not replace airplanes in any way, directly. He does not intend to compete with them. The airplane is all ready, everything is working. These are fast transports, both long distance and short distance. Here in our country, connections are lacking. In the Soviet Union, people flew between regions, but now this is no longer the case. In this regard, we do not compete, but rather complement the industry. From the perspective of transportation speed, an airplane is much faster than an airship. It's also clear to everyone that we are not competing here. It flies much slower, but it can carry a lot more and deliver it at a completely different price. That is, once again, operating companies engaged in air transportation have, in fact, an additional tool, and also to solve their own tasks related to the transportation of oversized cargo for delivery from one place to another, for example, to pick up from one location and transport to another. In general, why airships? It was indeed a ready-made technology, already proven over time. It does not compete with anyone. It only complements and enhances further. There is a very high demand in the market for this kind of service. I will explain in more detail a little later, but overall the demand for it is huge. The team is in place and it does not compete with anyone. And it is currently at the initial zero stage in our country, at the stage where large financial capital has not yet taken it. That is, there are engineers who built these airships and flew on them in the 90s and 2000s. But they are all currently working now, simply just earning a living like ordinary people, like everyone else, because perhaps maybe this story will eventually unfold later. The problem was that they dispersed like a team that was working on lighter-than-air flying vehicles, namely airships. They parted ways more for managerial and administrative reasons than because the airship was not in demand, or because they built it incorrectly, or for any other reason indeed. In general, it was the administration, well, the management. In short, the management messed up. And they are all currently working in various jobs. Some are teaching in my field. Some are sitting in corporations. Others are in the space industry. Some are in the oil and gas sector. And some have been retired for a long time. And this is the zero stage. It is impossible to attract large amounts of money for it. For example, government funds cannot be attracted, or from some private corporation, because the corporation will ask where to allocate the money. So there is one legal entity for one, and another airship operator for the other. They haven't done anything for a long time, there is no activity, and there are no employees at the legal entity. He says, give me this, and I will gather one, two, three over there. And that's usually where it all ends. Because a major investor wants to come and of course, see a facility where everything is operational and ready, where there is a foundation for receiving large amounts of money, 
meet all the management and get acquainted with the financial accounting design and production lines. Uh, they want to see that all of this is solid and only then will they invest money. This is in a classic, classical setting. Right now, in our country, the situation is far from classic and a major investor does not want to enter even when they have been convinced that there is this, that and the other. Now they are asking for the AGPV device. Well, right now, the situation is such that it will change soon, it's all clear, but that's how it is. And that's why with crowdfunding and why crowdfunding investing, it really turned out to be the most genuine venture here indeed. We have everything we need to combine all of this from the very beginning and launch it. And since it is at the zero stage, the potential financial output will be maximally broad or huge, however you want to describe it. In other words, by founding something, without creating a separate invention, such as a utility model or anything else, and not even establishing a conditional serial production or mass production of some hyper-necessary items that everyone needs, you will not achieve the same financial success and return as you would by founding an entire industry. This includes the development, production, and of course their commercial operation, plus their direct sale, meaning commerce. And not in just one country, but in all countries. You provide services for developments because external corporations will come. If they have a request to solve logistics issues, there are many corporations, and not only in our country are there enough of them, but there is an incredible number of them all over the world. And they, realizing that the first device has taken to the air, fulfilling its tasks, that it has technical specifications, and that the team is capable of this, will come with their proposal, while my task is to transport it from here to there. And this will not be some kind of standard solution. While there will be standard ones, this will be unique, tailored to a specific route. The route has certain altitude requirements, consistent winds, and temperature conditions, and there is a specific constant cargo. Therefore, this will be a unique vehicle created for specific tasks. The industry is briefly much more profitable than anything else, and all these factors have come together in front of us, making it indeed the most logical choice to start. And one very important point is that it just so happens that we all absolutely love airships. Few people have ever heard of them, knew about them, or have seen them in passing. But when you talk to people about airships, everyone feels an inner warmth specifically towards this type of aircraft. It seems peaceful, meaning that if there is an airship in the sky, everything is fine. It appears somewhat fairy tale like romantic, and so on, to the average person. And very often it is searched on Google or Yandex more than a hundred thousand times a month. Someone is simply looking for an airship. On YouTube, people watch videos about airships which have millions of views. There is a high demand on the planet among ordinary people, including myself, for airships. Everyone understands that if they were flying a hundred years ago, then if we take a century-old car and a modern car, we will realize that if airships were already flying with restaurants across the Atlantic a hundred years ago, what can we achieve today? There is a request. We have all the resources, so to speak. Everything is given to us to solve this task. And that's why I took so long to explain why airships after all, you see, and you know, and... Yes, Fedor, some have a question. You say that there used to be airships, but now there aren't. What is the reason that airships have not developed for so long? Mm. This is a philosophical perspective. Electric cars were the first to appear. There were also internal combustion engine vehicles, steam-powered vehicles, and motorcycles. Then they completely disappeared from the market. And now electric cars are indeed presented to us as something super modern. They once disappeared. Apparently, there was a lack of technologies, a lack of energy storage systems, and a lack of computers. However, energy storage systems were already functioning, 
but they apparently did not meet certain consumer quality standards. As a result, internal combustion engines turned out to be simpler to manage and manufacture. Everything has its time, as they say. The same goes for airships. They used to fly, and they were used earlier. But a set of various modern methods, advanced technologies, materials, computers, and a lot of other things can take it to a completely new level. I am confident that we ourselves do not fully realize how truly modern and incredibly amazing these devices will be in five to ten years. Technologies are developing very quickly. Where have they gone? Many questions, many answers, many hypotheses, many theories. They have disappeared somewhere. Everything new is well forgotten old. Fortunately, no one has forgotten about airships and there are still design teams available. And the most important thing is that the whole world is starting to build them. The Chinese are building them, the Americans are building them, the British are building them, the French are building them. The French are already operating small drones based on airships in Africa and the Chinese are already. They completed the certification of the first aircraft, which is a complete a copy of our Russian one that was built by our engineers in the 2000s. The whole world has moved back again. So the question is, where have they gone? And with the context that they have disappeared, why do we even need them? Well, no, they are needed. And the whole world has already accepted this. There is a good video made by an American blogger. We posted it on all our social media, and we can post it again. He also discusses airships, but he is not interested. He just does reviews as a tech blogger and says, Wow, it's an incredible thing. He is in touch with an expert, and they are discussing online together why not, and everyone agrees. He is receiving confirmation from all the experts on the Western side that this is an economically necessary thing. So, they have disappeared only to reappear again. Could you perhaps tell me more about the potential areas of application? So, as you said, they are not indeed a replacement for airplanes. This is their addition. In some areas, they may be more interesting and more effective than what exists today. Are there any specific examples of the application of airships, for instance, in various fields? Well, just recently, I understand our comrade, who also believes in airships and is moving with us towards the moment when they will fly. A detailed narrative has been delivered in great detail, an essay perhaps, in the form of providing an explanation of why a mobile clinic or mobile medical center and the reasons behind will be implemented on airships. A person simply sat down, thought about it, and detailed very thoroughly that we now have medical trains, medical buses, and so on in general. Russia is vast and in many remote areas it is not always possible to provide quality medical services everywhere. This is a reality and this task needs to be addressed. Mobile points are being created but they are not as mobile as the airship. There is not always a road. Somewhere there is a road that the medical laboratory has yet to reach. God knows what will happen to her. Somewhere there are no roads at all and getting somewhere there. To hell with the buses and trains, well, let's say, but how much safer would it be? How much larger would that very clinic, the medical laboratory on the airship be? It would rise up, well, from some district center, from the area of the district hospital, for example, and it would drag an entire hospital along the route, passing through and providing some well, medical services to the population. And there will be an innumerable number of various ideas about what an airship can carry with it. How will this story work out? Just like with computers. When the computer technology first emerged, it was only of interest to computer enthusiasts. Well, they were coding something, thinking about something unclear what exactly it's definitely not about whether it will definitely be a smartphone, a tablet, or a smart refrigerator. Everyone knows this story. 
Initially, computers were exclusively for geeks. And then came along brilliant figures like Steve Jobs and Bill Gates, who adapted everything for the user. As a visionary, he came and said, Look, this is something everyone needs. Why? Let me explain. Just wait a moment. And then, little by little, an endless number of applications for computers emerged. And the same will happen with airships. We will only be showcasing the capabilities of this air platform. Its safety, its environmental friendliness, its capabilities for vertical takeoffs, hovering in place, staying suspended at a certain point for a couple of days, and traveling thousands of kilometers. We will simply showcase its capabilities. People around the world are always moving, always looking for options, and now they will have yet another tool to solve their problems or realize their ideas. And I am sure there will be truly an infinite number of them. This could possibly be, I don't know, perhaps a flying concert hall. Why not? This could involve the transportation of towers that are already assembled for power transmission lines. These could be various monitoring services, cruises, or even the delivery of concrete to a construction site, for example, hypothetically. Why not? You could pour it right on top. But all of this is nonsense, fantasy. It is clear that there will be stricter, so to speak, technical aspects. In some cases, this will be real. In others, it will not be immediately real. And in some cases, it will be completely unrealistic. However, the areas of application are indeed very numerous. Overall, our entire life, well, on the planet, human civilization has developed in such a way that we are still a logistical civilization. We have cities along roads. We take from here and give to there. The very process of transferring goods on the planet is fundamental. Everything we do is in broad cooperation, in a collaborative manner. And the airship is one of the coolest and incredibly fascinating ways to move things on the planet. An endless variety of options will be found, with numerous options available. Well, let's maybe move on to what we are doing. You mentioned an infinite number of options, but we already know exactly which ones we will start with, how we will earn from this, and why we believe it will be commercially necessary, profitable, and beneficial. Tell me about the company that is being created, what kind of company it is, who will be involved in it, what kind of people are part of it, what the team is like, and what will be created within the framework of this company. So, what kind of company is this, and who are the people involved? Let me tell you, it is a Russian legal entity whose founders include a representative of the collective investor Solar Group, which is known for its significant contributions to various innovative projects. The other half consists of the project implementers, who are dedicated professionals with extensive experience in their respective fields. These are the designers, the manufacturers, and the top management, though I don't want to label them that way. In general, they are the people who will be organizing the processes. It is quite likely that industry institutions will definitely be involved as broad cooperation is planned. And there are definitely agreements with the same NAMI that he would like to be part of this legal entity. In general, on one side there is the investor in the form of Solar Group, and on the other side there is the team of implementers. Regarding the team of implementers, I repeat, these are the very designers who have done this before. Well, of course, this will involve production, and it is clear that a young, super-modern team will be recruited for this, and so on. This will all be part of the design bureau, but it won't even be just a design bureau. It will be a project implementation company. It will design the airship, build it, and also preliminarily construct the hangars for its operation. It is natural that everything needs to be developed, and so to speak, this is the main design bureau, which is one division of the company. The second is the production division. The third is the construction division, 
and the fourth is the operational division. We are currently forming this structure. It is currently being formed, according to the classic Soviet scheme, as everything used to be arranged, but with hints of modern realities. The Design Bureau, let's conditionally call it that for this project, brings together everyone in one place who can design these airships and manage the process of their design. It won't be the case that we just put the designers in a room and say, design an airship, and they sit there, brilliant as they are, no matter how many of them there are, even a hundred people, and they design it. No, the design of such large devices is generally carried out in collaboration with specialized institutes. One institute focuses on avionics, while another institute deals with shells, engines, four, five, six, fuel systems, and mathematics. That is, this is the design bureau, which is essentially the head office, the center of competence. It already manages and assigns technical tasks and collaboratively develops the preliminary design. The preliminary design has been created, it has been harmonized with everyone, and now we can move forward. The next step involves modeling, production, and more. This is the design bureau, and next to it there are also technologists, because what the designers have planned is good, but it also needs to be produced. The technologists have more constraints than the designers, such as time and resources. They need to understand what equipment is available, in what quantity, and what is generally possible and impossible. And so, a design bureau will be established as part of this important project. This will be, in essence, the core of the parent company, essentially, conditionally. Yes, there is more being created here. There is land, two hangars, production facilities, a school, and various external business projects. I don't like these external words in this presentation, but I will explain. As soon as the design bureau is established, it is already being created, spaces are being rented, and people are being hired for work. Soon we will share everything, show it all, film videos, and conduct a comprehensive overview. The question immediately arises, yes, these devices require hangars, which means land is needed to place them somewhere. As part of this project, which we are currently calling the Next Generation Airship, we plan to name the implementing company Nova or Aeronova. Right now we are working on the trademark, but that is not our top priority at the moment. We are focusing more on the legal structure, as well as administrative and financial aspects. All of these things are in progress, but they are not the main focus right now. It will be called Nova, or we might consider another option. This is the hundredth time I'm making this request, and I'm not the only one sending it. You keep sending them while Nova is in the lead. In general, for this project, for the next generation airship, land is needed. And I have already told those who have heard, please be patient. For those who haven't heard, I will explain that there are several options. The first option, of course, is to definitely acquire your own land. There, about 100 hectares are needed, preferably 200, so that the land is flat, without hills, and ideally without forests. It is possible to have water bodies, such as lakes or wide rivers, and it is even necessary to have a lake or a wide river because airships are ideally suited for landing on water calmly. Then there will be various docking mast fields, anchoring devices, and so on, but the coolest and most impressive feature will definitely be on the water, and it will be present in every airship. This is both for water and so on. In general, the first option is to buy land. The second option is to rent land. The third option is to partner with those who already have the necessary land. Such proposals come from many aerotowns. In these aerotowns, some people jump with parachutes, others fly on paragliders, and there are places where they train pilots for private light aviation, including helicopters, airplanes, and so on. In general, there were many air cities in the Soviet Union because light aviation was well developed. There are many aerograds between cities, regions, and so on. Most of them are privatized, 
well, maybe not all, but in general, a large part. And at the time, it was all easy, both in the 90s and in the 2000s. Now, when everything is, the state mechanism is stabilizing, regulations are being established, and overhead costs for these air cities are increasing. And for some, it has simply become too costly to keep and maintain it. And it is precisely these people who reach out and say, we have Aerograd guys, let's think about how to utilize it for your goals. Look at the spaces. Such proposals come not only from Moscow and the nearby regions, but also from the south. They even call and say that there are many options in general. And now we have this administrative fork in management regarding which path to take. Naturally, we choose the first path, which is indeed the quickest to implement and less costly. It is, of course, definitely necessary to partner with someone to avoid burying money in this land in the administrative work of obtaining permits, because this land needs to be formalized. An endless amount of, in general, bureaucratic terms and paperwork, including this time, well, time is essentially money and a resource, and to avoid wasting it naturally, it makes more sense and is more logical at first to enter into a partnership with someone who already has the land designated as an aerograd, where flights are already permitted, and we simply partner with them. By partnership, I mean a kind of intertwining of companies. We would take a 1% stake in their company, and they would take a 1% stake in ours, conditionally. And that's it. We are practically setting up the first hangar at our Aerograd. Here are the percentages and other details. Everything is still being negotiated. As soon as everything is firmly signed, we will naturally announce it. And this is the first most logical step. But most likely this will be done within the framework of the first global stage. Those are the very amounts we announce. Those are the very deadlines. Perhaps some second option for acquiring our own land might also potentially be considered by the end of the project because many bases are needed. They are essentially needed in every region and in some places there are several, each for different airships. However, in this project, the construction of only two hangars for two types of aircraft is currently being considered. This is precisely where we move on to the next point. So, the situation with the land is clear. Most likely, we will partner with someone and there we will install two hangars, in succession. The first type of aircraft is a small flying yacht, although it is called that, in reality it is quite large. The airship itself has space for six people, plus there is a restroom and a small kitchen. You can move around inside. It's not like a car where you just sit down. It offers more space than a minivan, designed for six people, comfortable, allowing for walking around almost like not being in a helicopter. The airship accommodates six passengers. This is the first part of size of the little yacht. It is small and low risk. And we will start with it. It can lift one ton with such a gondola for six people, meaning one ton of water, food or something else, luggage or any equipment you want to take. In the uncrewed version, that is, without this passenger gondola, it can already lift two tons of cargo and move it somewhere in an unmanned configuration. But this is one size of the airship, this is one platform, and a hangar needs to be built specifically for it. A hangar is not a production facility. A hangar is not a garage. As many people think, a dirigible does not need a garage to be stored in. No, it can safely stand outside like an airplane and nothing critical will happen to it. The hangar serves as both a service center and an assembly shop facility. All necessary components are produced in broad cooperation, starting from the gondola and ending with engines, propellers, gas systems, valves, electronics, and onboard systems. Everything included. Everything converges in the Elling. The hangar is designed in such a way that the space itself allows for the assembly of the airship, the necessary equipment for this is available and in general it is designed for assembly, technical maintenance and repair. All components have arrived and it will be assembled in a week or two since everything is already in a ready state. 
it will be taken out of the hanger and theoretically it only needs to go back and forth for maintenance which is according to the technical documentation released with this device. He needs to go there once a month or once every two weeks the rest of the time. That's it. And all the remaining time in the hangar, the following devices can be produced. This will be done. The hangar will. The project plans for Elling to produce these small yachts in series. In the first year, there will be up to 12 units produced. One collected, brought out, second collected, brought out, one collected, brought out, second collected, brought out. It is being designed as a two-seater, so one can be assembled while the other is brought in for maintenance. That's uh, the first thing being built. And as soon as this thing is built, how will it be built? Again, our design bureau provides the most precise technical specifications, or even develops them in collaboration with the relevant institute that we have. In the country there is a specialist, uniting all of this with such a word, who builds hangars for airplanes at airports, both for civilian and military use, and special licenses are required, a lot of everything, and they are engaged in their development. This hangar is being worked on in collaboration with them, all the technical aspects, and then a regular construction company can build it. But there are still some questions. There are particular aviation nuances involved, Ordinary builders can certainly handle it. They can concrete the site, erect the metal structure, and other related tasks, such as so on. But in general, everything will be created in cooperation with them. And as soon as the first hangar is built, the second one will be designed in parallel, and construction will begin immediately. And all of this is included in the project cost. If you don't know yet, we will show a little later more about the first hangar, in the first hangar, since they are indeed next generation. We are incorporating the possibility of landing on the roof, as you may have seen in films or experienced in person. This is also common in Russia. In some residential complexes, helicopter pads have been built on the roofs. It is possible to create new residences or modify existing helicopter pads for the landing of airships. That is to say, the airship can be landed on the roof, which is safe, and we will demonstrate this specifically at the first docking. An aircraft will emerge from it, conducting a test flight or even a tourist flight after the flight tests are completed, and it will land on the roof. It will land on the roof where there will be a special device that will also be able to rotate, because the airship needs to face into the wind. And on this same roof it will land, and in a manner of speaking, dock, and finally come to rest settle. All subsequent sizes of the airships demonstrate their versatility. As you can see, there is a platform that accommodates small, large, and even hyper-large airships. Everything is universal and can land on one roof without exerting any pressure on it. Nothing happens. This is the testing of the technology. We will build the second hangar without this. The first one is sufficient. The second will be larger for the next type of apparatus size. Yes, we will talk about them a little later, including the quantities in which they will be produced. But for the next one, it's definitely already referred to as a conditional 10-tonner. Although it weighs 10 tons when in tourist, passenger, or cargo passenger configuration. When it is exclusively in cargo configuration, again, as in the first case, if the gondola with internal space created for people is not needed, then the systems that are also designed for people, all of this has some weight. In the tourist version, the 10-ton airship can carry 10 tons of passengers, provisions and other accompanying items, while in the unmanned version it can carry 15 tons. It can already currently transport cargo efficiently and effectively. This is highly anticipated to be one of the most widely mass-produced vehicles in the near future because a market demand infrastructure has already been created for it. Because it is customary in the world to transport such sizes, weights, and cargo by helicopters. Here is the most mass-produced helicopter, the MI-8, which can carry up to four tons over a certain distance for a certain cost. A 10-ton vehicle, which is cheaper to produce than this MI-8, can transport 10 tons in the cargo Ash-15, 
much further at approximately the same speeds, conditionally. A bit slower if the wind is favorable, faster otherwise, and at a significantly lower cost than a helicopter. And helicopters have, so to speak, created a market again in such a way that when someone is solving their task, whether it is a business, technological, or logistical one, they look at the tools they have at their disposal. They think, ah, I have a helicopter that can carry four tons, for example. That's it, I'm using it, and a certain business process is being established. Someone is designing something, thinking, okay, when I design this, I need to consider how I will deliver it. Aha, by helicopter, four tons, and he designs it for the helicopter. And so, while these helicopters are being created, used, and are currently being developed and utilized, they are forming a market for services around them. And so, it is very advantageous to introduce this device to the service market. With such dimensions and characteristics, meaning it will surpass everything currently available in the market in economic, technical, and other indicators, and demonstrate new principles, First, it will carry more, second, further, third, cheaper, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. It is clear that logically, there should be 20 ton, 40 ton, and 70 ton models appearing next. But it is not a fact that they must, because it is quite possible that the next economically viable size category lies much further ahead. Here we have 10, and over there, for example, 200, and all of this is described by economists and analysts, suggesting that this is most likely the case. But in any event, we need to go through these types of complexities before reaching such large scales, because 10 tons is good, but nothing happens just like that. They built a summer house there and rushed to construct a high rise. There still needs to be experience, technological capability, and so on. There are tasks for 20 ton, 40 ton, and even 50 ton vehicles but they are very specialized, and the devices will also be created in the near future. These are precisely the external business projects that were mentioned, such as these. But they are unlikely to be serial models. Most likely, they will be technology demonstrators. For the client, if a client emerges, and also for us to gain experience as we approach larger devices. If a client comes and says, I have a task to transport 20, 30, 40 tons, I saw that you can do it. We respond, yes, we can, and we move on. However, of course, we won't refuse to tailor it to your needs. It all makes sense. So in general, I got a bit distracted, two hangers. What do we have next? It says production. It is being created within the framework of this project. However, the production is not being established in the sense that we will build some kind of factory. We need land for the factory as well as funds for its construction, equipment, and so on. No production means that we retain critical technological processes, and we need to establish these processes. In fact, it doesn't matter what equipment we use. Whether it is rented, it is not as good as having your own, of course, but it is necessary. In case there will be rental spaces, we do not need to build any factory or do anything else. To achieve this, we need to keep a few critical technologies to ensure that this intellectual property does not leak from the company and to protect ourselves. We want to avoid a situation where, after sharing all our secrets through this broad cooperation, so to speak, exposing ourselves to the world, we start producing something, and someone who wishes to do the same can simply follow the same chain and manage to replicate everything. On one hand, it's kind of cool that someone else needs this. On the other hand, do we really need it? Perhaps, after all, it will be investment projects. And therefore, critical technologies will be, so to speak, hidden and mastered at their own or friendly industrial sites. There is a process known as shell soldering. This includes the production of the shells themselves. There is welding, soldering, and so on, cutting, and other processes. This equipment is all quite inexpensive. It has been well known to everyone for a long time. It is available in our country and in all other countries. Buying it is not a problem. And placing it 
in a small hangar that can be quickly set up for us to weld these shells is not some separate investment project for outrageous money. It involves small expenses for our own protection and for the technologists. In general, this is what is meant by the word production. A bit later, we may specify which critical technologies will be behind us, but it is quite likely that it is not worth doing this for competitors or detractors to know. The school being created within the project is not for children, although it will probably need to be established for children at some point. It is a school for pilots and a school for technicians. Training for all personnel who will be involved in the operation and management of the airships. Because you arrive at the airport and starting from the moment you walk through the door, people appear and you check in. Custom services are not counted. Some people are loading luggage onto the plane, some are fueling it and some are de-icing it. There are captains sitting there, flight attendants, a lot of staff, and this staff needs to be trained everywhere. It is clear that the infrastructure for airships is indeed much lighter than that for international airplanes especially. But in any case, personnel is definitely needed and they need to be trained. There is indeed nothing super complicated about training a dirigible pilot or a flight attendant. All the documents and procedures are the same. It's just that there are currently no airships, meaning there are no methodologies available at the moment. However, in general, all legislation implies that when you open an aviation school, even as a private individual, you can establish your own aviation school for light aircraft, helicopters, and so on. When you encounter the regulatory documentation, you will find that it states that the aviation school is for training in uh, airplanes, helicopters, and airships. And it is already laid out in all the info docs the airship exists because they have already been always both in the Soviet Union and in modern Russia. And all this documentation has made it this far. There are no problems on this side. And there are no issues with creating schools either because calls are already coming in from interested parties who say, wow, it's so cool that you are working with airship. I have my own school. It's indeed very easy, ready. And you could see there, this person is Sergei. He spoke on the 7th at our big convention. And he is not the only one with an aviation school. He is the only one interested. And in general, no one sees any issues with this. The school is essential for us, even for officially operating them, as all pilots must have special licenses, and all technicians must also be properly trained, and everything must be correctly documented. In general, we need it both for our personal project needs and for the industry as a whole, because later on, as soon as this school, so to speak, prepares all the necessary personnel that covers, for example, one cell. This is the servicing of a specific airship. In the future, this model can also be put into practice in all other regions, wherever there are schools, as they will be open there, because pilots will be needed, as this is an industry in various ways. This will also be a central school, just like the Unified Airship Hub here followed by many airship hubs and many schools. This is all clear, and the school itself is a commercial structure, and the airships will be created as commercial entities, and someone will be responsible for these. I want to open not only a school to teach airship pilots, which is really cool, but also to train airplane and helicopter pilots and earn money from it, because an entire industry is developing, and a lot of people need to be trained. Currently, everything is structured as a commercial venture. I don't know how it is now, but most likely it will be profitable. There is hope, or rather a conditional understanding of when they will even start reviving departments in our country for training engineers, technicians, and pilots directly from universities for airships. But for now, this is all a long process we can very quickly implement what we need based on the existing school. 
to create, so to speak, this mechanism and then scale it up and retransmit it both wide and high, as you definitely wish, and all of this is within the framework of this project. Additionally, the external business projects, as I mentioned, involve the subsequent dimensions of airships, their types, and so on. They are not external. Some are still definitely within the framework of this project, but they significantly exceed the budget of this project. That is, in the project it will be created, you can even include the next slide here, it will be created in the project. Well, yes, I wanted to talk about this, not that, but a little back. Two flying yacht devices will be created, weighing one to two tons, depending on how they are built, and their subsequent serial production. But for that cost, two devices of this type and two devices of the 10-ton class will be created. Why two? Because one is very small for conducting tests to obtain a type certificate. When in general you have built an aircraft, there should be at least two of them, ideally three, in order to conduct all the necessary flight tests and ultimately obtain the certificate that confirms it is safe for operation and can be produced serially. Two units for these purposes a 10-ton model, two units for these purposes. And as soon as the type certificate is obtained, it means that we can start serial production. You can go back there with the numbers. And it turns out that within the framework of these $100 million, and this is $100 million already, including referrals, Pavel will explain something, meaning it is not 100 plus referrals, but just 100 in total. These external costs, as stated in the business project, are not included in the budget, and therefore, additional costs are expected. All these innovative and groundbreaking projects will be meticulously and carefully created by this highly skilled and reputable design bureau, but it is quite likely that in the near future, crowdfunding will no longer be necessary for them, because creating two yacht-type devices and two 10-ton devices Conducting flight tests and obtaining a type certificate. The company is commercializing. Start accepting developments for payment from large businesses. That is, the business says, I need a device, for example, some unique one. This is development. We receive money, we generate profit from this money, and with the profit we start designing these devices. This is a serial production. We have made two devices so far and we are currently operating them ourselves to gain experience. However, we already have an understanding of who will buy the first device, and when they see that it flies, they will say, I want this one. We will respond, wait, you can have the same one in a couple of months. Easy. We can definitely do it in a month as well if you absolutely pay a bit more. In general, these devices will be produced and sold, and profits will start coming in immediately. And so, the external business project can be developed both through crowdfunding and with our own funds for commercialization. We will decide all of this together with you. What to do with the first profit? Receive it as dividends? Or should we invest in another device? Or attract a large external investor? Because even before the flight tests of the first devices, as I mentioned, the zero stage will be completed. A design bureau will be established and a wide cooperation of developers, manufacturers and others will be involved. For a large investor, this is already a signal that the zero stage has been completed. This thing definitely works and is being implemented. And they will want to come in and say, I have a lot of money. We will tell them, this part is already funded by crowdfunding, this yacht is a 10-ton vessel, and this one is not yet funded. Would you like to invest in a 20-ton vessel? Because we can do 200, but we still need to go step by step. So they can invest here, and we are currently creating such a legal structure for this parent company, Nova, so that a large investor, by bringing in their substantial capital, 
does not overshadow the strict half that is allocated for crowd investors. We want to avoid a situation when a big guy arrives, hands over money, and then the crowd shrinks away. No. What we are doing is that, guys, there was a zero stage. Large sums of money did not come in. We attracted all of this through crowdfunding. So please, now you can invest in small shares in some parallel companies that we will create together. Our parent company will invest there, and you will invest there as well. In general, it could be like that. It may be that we will do them with profit, potentially. Perhaps we will likely keep the crowd. This is all a future perspective in the near future. Here it mentions three to five years. This is precisely the design bureau, land, hangars, two units of one type, two units of another type, certification tests, a school, technologies, and of course, certification tests, everything. The project effectively concluded when we received the type certificate. Consequently, we succeeded. We have the apparatus ready for production, and we already have buyers for these devices. We have also ordered the development of other devices with a timeline of three to five years. Well, the capitalization of over a billion dollars is based on the most modest estimates, and I will reiterate that there are many objections, messages, and suggestions about how you calculated this capitalization and where you even got this billion from. What are you talking about? I will reiterate about the industry. We are starting from scratch to build such a huge company of such incredible size that this capitalization is very modest, calculated according to the most rudimentary laws. Here is the annual profit of the company, multiply it by three, and that is your capitalization. Without assessments of intellectual properties, without evaluations of prospects, without evaluations of future devices, without expansion of production, without expansion of the births, without anything. Just take the annual profit, multiply it by three, and there is the capitalization. How do we plan to exactly achieve this annual profit in three to five years? I, and how this is indeed a conditionally serial production of those very 10-ton vehicles. Well, not conditionally, but the serial production of 10-ton vehicles plus the operation of those that exist, plus the sale of 10 flying yachts, and all of this from two hangars. They will most likely most likely need to be more, several more, several more hangars will have to be installed. And all of this will already be done within the framework of external business projects. They simply do not fall within this budget. They go beyond the limits, but when there is demand, money appears. Everything is being built, and the profit will be much greater, including the capitalization. But so that no one thinks it's crazy, that's the point. Approximately 1 billion in capitalization for the serial production and sale of 10-ton vehicles and flying yachts. And that's not so much about 1 billion in total. One can indeed see how much New Zeppelin, the German company, sold its airships for very clearly. I wouldn't call them modern. They are modern because they are flying now. There isn't much to criticize about their actual modernity. They are cool guys for still having it. However, one can look at how much they sold these airships for, and it's more like an analogy to a flying yacht. For several tens of millions of dollars, one unit, uh, I honestly don't remember, 20, 30, 40. Once, they sold one unit for approximately 20 and another for 50. Everything depends on the configuration. It's clear when it was sold and to whom. You can check how much the MI-8 is produced and sold for on the market. And you can see how much various private planes are produced and sold for on the market. The airship will have its own niche. It will be more comfortable than helicopters and planes. It will be safer and it will transport more than helicopters. The average price for 10 tons is emerging in the market, and by producing about 20 units a year. You can divide the capitalization by three, get the profit, and calculate how much one unit costs. Well, according to the market, 
check the market price, be ready to buy it. Petya, you mentioned 20 units per year. Let's say in that quantity, who would need them? I mean, this is essentially a competitor to the MI8 helicopter, as you said. That is, its main function is to transport cargo. And in this case, it could also carry a large number of people if it is a passenger variant. In other words, can you tell me more about why they might be needed in such quantities and where they can be specifically applied? I am more than sure that the first 20 units will simply be taken by Arab countries. Because calls have already come in from one, and calls have come in from another. It seems that the third one is starting to itch. For them, these devices are needed as tourist attractions and for demonstration purposes. They love to showcase their capabilities and superiority. And they ask, like, you should only sell it to us first. We're like, come on guys, no problem. They're like, no, 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 the problem is that you have to sell it to us first. Like, which one? They are like, which one is there? They are like, well, the first will be the 10-ton vehicles. He is like a 10-ton tourist vehicle will do. We will be able to travel in luxurious, so to speak, salons along the borders of our neighbors and show what we have that you don't. We, I say, yes, of course, that will work. A 10-ton vehicle can be made as a tourist model. They are so wonderful. How many of them do you plan to produce? So this is the kind of conversation that's happening. And the Arab countries will definitely be taking them. First of all, we need these couple of devices for our own operation. Plus, the Arabs will definitely take it. And the My8, of course, will not be suitable for the large tasks that we already have lined up, which are agreed upon with Russian companies. However, the My8 will be suitable for another commercial load for which there is already demand. And there is no point in discussing this now. Conditionally speaking, the first 20 tourist vehicles will fly off around the world like hotcakes. And in the first year, we will secure a profit, we will recoup the project, and we will even be able to pay dividends. There, with some kind of multiplier, we will still have money left if the investors say, please pay everything in dividends. But if they don't say that, and we all show prudence, then we will still have money for the production of additional hangars and the design of larger vehicles. And I am quite sure that the first 20 will fly off as tourist models. The next 20 will be more commercial, and which specific models will emerge will be shown by time. The task is set. There are search and rescue tasks. Most likely the next 20 will be somewhat governmental involving the Ministry of Emergency Situations, fires, discoveries, in general, social issues. Maybe these medical ones, because there are some hotspots that are required to be closed. And most likely, based on these 10-ton vehicles, there will be one, two, three of such devices made there. The cargo drone weighing 15 tons will also find its application in commerce as its technical and economic indicators will be very beneficial for business, we will negotiate with the logistics industry. We are talking about the most minimal implementation in essence. And if we visualize what you mentioned in the form of images, then here it is in our presentation from the design bureau. As part of the design bureau, I don't know if the presentation is visible right now. But this is what Fedor was talking about. A conditional design bureau as a sort of core is a team of engineers who will be engaged in design, development, and everything else. As part of this, we are creating two models of airships, two-ton and 10-ton airships. The two-ton vehicle is primarily intended for some small tourist flights and perhaps even for transportation services. A very promising direction is various surveillance of the territory, monitoring weather conditions, piloted and unmanned options. And the 10 ton vehicle that you mentioned, it seems to be either a cargo version, which currently appears to be one of the most promising based on the feedback from potential clients. But as you just mentioned, some people like the Arabs in particular 
would like to have a flying hotel to be cooler than everyone else to showcase their capabilities. To the public from this flying hotel, this is also all possible. The land you mentioned, specifically where two airships will be located, along with a school and the production of important and essential critical nodes and elements. Another important point we discussed is that in our minimum execution scheme, there are external clients because nothing prevents us from developing some external airships for specific niches and directions at this stage. Maybe you could tell me in more detail who you have already communicated with and what kind of external projects might be there. I can actually tell you in detail about Roscosmos. The problems of the word loco, a good task that needs to be solved, and it will most certainly likely be resolved in the best possible way with the help of airships. This is the transportation of launch vehicles from the manufacturing plant to the Vostokny Cosmodrome. All the advice over the past few years has been carefully thought through, analyzed, and approved. There are letters suggesting that we should start developing a joint technical specification for these devices. Here is the technical specification regarding the specific loads, where to transport them from and to. We have all these documents. In other words, well, Roscosmos is also not ready to participate in the initial stage, to gather all this history, manage it, and seek financing. But as soon as he realizes that everything has started to spin, and that the team is assembled and implementation will begin, he will be the first customer to say, I understand, let's build the vehicles. There are not only options for transporting launch rockets, but also for rescuing astronauts. We currently have several calculated landing zones for spacecraft, and after all, he cannot land precisely at a point. Technically, he has a certain area. There are even films made about this, where a spacecraft, for some reason, does not even reach the zone. It needs to be searched for. Of course, he has radio beacons there. If they are working, then that's great. At least we understand where he is. But it is not so easy to select a spacecraft using existing methods, indeed. And therefore, most often, not most often, it aims for a large body of water, but somewhere in a recognizable area, so that it uh, can land, approach, and retrieve. It's all much simpler if he landed in the forest or somewhere else. And that's for... Currently, there are even icebreakers being proposed to operate in the Arctic Ocean for the rescue of astronauts. Just understand that after an astronaut lands, he has to wait for the ship or anyone else to reach him. But if there are, say, three airships patrolling around the landing zone, they all have a short radius within which they can quickly arrive. An airplane can circle, of course, but it cannot pick up the capsule. A helicopter cannot circle for long either, as it will run out of fuel and crash. An airship can arrive in the designated area. Using solar panels, powered by the sun, and electric motors, stabilizing itself without consuming any fuel, just waiting for the spacecraft to land. That is, it does not consume fuel, and such a project has also been developed. This is when the device can land on water, accept this item, and from the field, from the forest, conditionally from any surface, and inside, all the space is equipped for receiving astronauts with medical offices and various other facilities. That is, we need to go through the initial stage. And within these three to five years, this client will definitely be ours because there is currently a broad technological sovereignty movement in space and these tasks will need to be addressed. Airships handle this best. And everyone understands this now, both them and us and everyone else, and it is definitely going to happen. And there is not only Roscosmos. There are several other clients that deal with resources and logistics of resources both within the country and beyond its borders. 
There are also interested parties on that side, with many new projects where logistics issues are still being resolved. They are aware of airships, and you need to show, roughly speaking, that you have started, and then we can continue the conversation. There are indeed many such clients. It turns out that within this budget, within this company, evaluating this specific step as minimal, we are saying that we are creating our own products and selling them simply in a quantity of some units to clients and customers in a way. We work with large contracting companies like Roscosmos and other similar entities, which can afford this and need highly specialized airships designed for their specific goals and tasks and requirements because our company is primarily the brain that can create and generate all the necessary components and systems for a particular airship to take off and ensure that it does so successfully. Thanks to the fact that this team has been assembled, it will only grow and expand. Yes, that's correct. Plus, about the clients, right now there is a government order Many people might have seen it. We posted it in the chat. We can again duplicate it just like that video of the American tech blogger and reviewer where the government itself instructs all relevant and other interested organizations to provide their development programs by the fourth quarter of this year, that is by the new year. The government also has a number of tasks for our specific state and I constantly forget that we are not a single country and that our project is international with a pressing need in many countries. First of all, we have our own issues in Yakutia, the connectivity of territories, the far north, and there are indeed an incredible number of tasks this new tool frees our hands and the economy will scale all of this and resolve it. But there are indeed other real aspects. There are negotiations with Indonesia because it is precisely in their water transport that they carry out small scale, even logistics. In general, they need several devices to constantly hover in the air and monitor what is happening below. And stratospheric airships, which were highly valued, were also desired for their own secure and reliable communication. We also have connections with Indonesia and Africa. In general, there are many countries and many clients. I hope we can manage to accomplish everything in time. By the way, once the website is up, we will have a fully and completely finished version with all the materials, because enough various different agreements have already been concluded to understand that there is interest from a large number of different companies and clients, and some preliminary agreements have even been made. If we talk about a longer term perspective, that is five to 10 years, or you can already see in the presentation, how much additional content is already emerging. Here, the operating company appears, but in reality, it will emerge almost immediately, as this is one of the most important elements but the most important thing to note is that as the company grows and more resources become available, there will be an opportunity to work not just with one or two clients, but with a larger number of external clients. In addition, the own capacities are increasing with a greater number of docks. In this scheme, there are already four, as well as additional vehicles, 20 tons, 40 tons, 200 tons, and a stratospheric airship. The path of development here can indeed vary, as Fedor mentioned today. Large capital can be attracted. For example, a separate subsidiary company could be created that would focus specifically on stratospheric airships. And the budget for constructing a stratospheric airship could be utilized as the capital of a private investor. Or it could also be crowdfunding if necessary and if there is demand and interest in it, potentially. At the same time, as we mentioned today, this can also be done with one's own money, which is perfectly normal. 
without attracting any borrowed or investor capital. As a result, there is indeed a clear understanding today about the creation of six, let's say, such projects, six flying vehicles. Fyodor, if you want, you can comment on the other four and tell something more detailed. Well, I talked about everything conditionally here. The transitional will be 20, 40, then 200. He is indeed already more interesting from a commercial and economic point of view. His range of tasks is expanding even further, and the economy of the state is becoming even more attractive. Generally, the bigger, the better, and this applies to all plans, both in terms of economic efficiency and fuel efficiency, and so on. The main point is that there wasn't just one noise, there were several. Regarding the stratosphere, I haven't mentioned it yet, but let me also say something about the 40-ton vehicle. These devices, weighing between 20 and 40 tons, will likely also be tourist-oriented, either sold or operated by the company itself, which is beneficial both commercially and in terms of gaining operational experience. Because when you sell to someone, you have to provide a lot of operational guidelines, standards, rules, and overall experience, and all the personnel need to be trained, so everything is created for this purpose. Here, 40 tons is the vehicle that can already reach anywhere you want in a tourist version of the 10-ton vehicle, even to the North Pole, in fact. Indeed, actually, it will be more pleasant to do this on a 40-ton vehicle because it will already be double-decked, meaning there will be two floors with a balcony, providing access to the open air and a terrace. As I mentioned, all of these units will be produced in pairs. This is a must, and here are two tourist 50-ton vessels. These are really cool cruise ships, on which it would be very pleasant to travel as a couple. They go together. On one you are by yourself, and on the other you can look around. It's twice as cool. If not ten times, because while you, we were riding on the airship, and when you look at it from the side, you experience a wow effect. The depot is such a magical thing, big and beautiful. When you look at it from below, you think, wow, there's so little useful space, and it's so large. Everyone has these thoughts. Then when you step inside, you think, ah, there is enough space inside, I feel quite comfortable but you no longer see the airship itself. You are simply in some space where it is quiet, calm, and cozy. You can walk around there, talk peacefully, and climb out the window. It is completely safe, but you no longer see any airship. So when they fly side by side, it will be absolutely very cool. Most likely, it will undoubtedly be for tourism, and it will be proportionate to the stratospheric one. That is, the stratospheric device will not be able to lift those same 40 tons because an airship can lift a heavier load. The closer it is to the ground, the more air pressure it has. It contains helium, and there is a certain lift force here. When the air pressure decreases, the lift forces diminish, and the closer the apparatus flies to the ground, the more it can lift. However, the capacity of the 40-ton vehicle and the stratospheric vehicle, which are much smaller, will be able to catch the same amount. And by building a hangar for a 40-ton vehicle, we are thereby also building a hangar for the stratosphere. The 40-ton vehicles have been made, they have passed this dimension, and now the hangar is used for stratospheric vehicles. And so, stratospheric devices are also very, very incredibly, firstly, a cool and enticing idea in itself. And it's not just an idea, it has already been used. Again, all of this was before, but it was previously on stratospheric probes. You can Google Lunar Google. There was a program that produced balloons that flew in the stratosphere purely in the winds. Simply, no, some were able to hover there, changing their altitude, catching the wind. But still, it was not an airship, and they were carrying out their tasks and connections, both scientific and others. Well, then hard times came, unfortunately, perhaps significantly due to the COVID-19 pandemic and they cut this program. Currently, communication, remote sensing, remote zoning, ground probing, and other tasks are performed from space. Previously, these were completely enormous satellites, such technologies, such sizes, 
Now all satellites are getting smaller, smaller, smaller. It's clear that they are in the form of cubes. This is the size of a modern satellite. You won't accomplish much work there, but a whole swarm of these satellites is quite likely. In other words, this whole matter is decreasing in cost, but it cannot yet be cheaper than a stratospheric platform in the form of an airship. It is no longer a balloon. A dirigible differs from a balloon in that a balloon is uncontrollable. A dirigible, from the French word dirigent, means controllable. And so a stratospheric controlled vehicle of sufficiently serious size with the necessary energy on board can already perform tasks similar to those carried out by impressive satellites in space. However, to launch a satellite, a huge rocket is usually built, typically a three-stage rocket with a booster stage, and there is a third stage as well. And this is how such a satellite is constructed, and that's the whole thing. Elon Musk has learned to land them. Well done. They are reusable. They profit. In our country, they are single use. You launched this satellite. You took long to build the rocket and it was expensive. I spent time and money building the satellite. I launched it into space. I invested money. We have not yet learned to service satellites. If something happens to them, something happens to them. If you change the orbit, for example, well, you can conditionally say that, but it is no longer a satellite. It is already a whole space station and it is unlikely that it can change its orbit significantly, only adjust it. And the stratospheric device costs significantly more, a thousand times less than a rocket. It can lift a satellite. Of course, it can lift this one too. It doesn't matter. There's no need to lift this one. There will be other instruments because the altitudes are different. The tasks are a bit different. Yes, a satellite can fly very high, hovering over a single point. It can be in stationary orbits or fly low, meaning it either changes the image or tracks the same space from a very distant point. Here, the height of the stratosphere is from 15 to 20 kilometers, and it can hover at a point. That is, for this, the existing, well, the accompanying corresponding technology is attached here. And unlike a rocket, it can return this satellite to its place. Both the string drilling platform and this equipment can be serviced. It can be raised back to the specified point, and these points can be changed. In general, from an economic, technical, and logical perspective, from all angles, accomplishing tasks. It is cheaper, more profitable, and more efficient to do this with such devices than to launch rockets into space. Of course, rockets have their own market in space. They will fly and so on. But these platforms also have a very broad future. For example, that country which does not want to get involved in this, for the most part, well, simply a race of flexing muscles, like we launched something into space. They need to. They can't. The same goes for Indonesia. There is also a discussion about this with them. They say we just need to carry out our communication tasks there, surveillance, probing, and so on, and there. Being able to launch a few satellites into orbit is certainly good, but we would like to have control ourselves. A stratospheric vehicle like this completely suits us, and most countries on the planet feel the same way. The countries that have their own families of satellites for various purposes are very wealthy, and there is indeed a market for stratospheric platforms. These 10-ton stratospheric platforms will be created with consideration for their capitalization and the tasks they will perform, which will also yield stratospheric profits. This is clear to everyone, and everyone is trying to do it now. However, we are in a very strange time where you can explain something in scientific and technical terms for a long time and people won't believe you. But if you make a beautiful presentation showing how you lift a capsule with people into the stratosphere and talk about a stratospheric hotel, investors immediately appear and support is readily available. Thus, real engineers have to resort to such measures.
whether they want to or not. In fact, many people indeed actually want to ascend to the stratosphere. It's actually simply just a marketing gimmick. Whoever can lift and control one, two, three, or even five tons in the stratosphere will already be considered a super cool monopolist. And of course, he will first lift this very capsule. He might take off in it himself, or he might be the first tourist, some billionaire. Nowadays, it is common to mix things taking money from billionaires to implement some large project with that funding. Plus, we are all like this. There is wonderful charity here, but then let's talk about our employee or their disabled child. It's just terrible. They will lift this device, prove globally that they can do it technically, and then the commercial load will fly into space. It will fly there, not into space, but into the stratosphere. Communication will fly there, reconnaissance will fly there, and so on and so forth. This is what satellites are currently doing. We also plan to engage in this, and many ask again, I would personally be interested in ascending to the stratosphere. Is this possible? It is possible. Will we do this? I don't know. Perhaps I would actually like to. In the world, you can Google it. Several startups have already announced by which specific year they will conditionally suspend a hermetically sealed capsule in the air where there will be some sort of near space journey. You will rise into the atmosphere and see this boundary between the atmosphere and space. It's really cool. I would also like to see that, and we will see this by the way, but in the mode of video transmission, we will be launching balloons into the stratosphere in the near future. It's not that actually difficult. We really have guys on our engineering team for whom this is a hobby. Well, hobbies related to earning money are conditionally the same. We will show and tell. But let's see if we can independently rise on Sirius platform. That's a bit more about the stratosphere. By the way, I think while I was actually talking that, that some companies just show a really cool picture and already attract huge interest. Investors just come in and so on. We have a similarly interesting situation in the project right now. It reminds me of the previous project when people initially came in and many didn't believe it saying, wow, they want to build such a building. And now the situation is the same. Someone is sitting and thinking, well, yes, an airship is great. Of course, it would be cool to fly in one, but there are some doubts. I can just imagine what will happen to those people when our first airship takes to the sky that is to say, the project itself will immediately rise to a whole new level. And how people will regret who are watching us now if they do not take part in the project. Because, of course, it is one thing, as you said, one such action, particularly striking, it still directly demonstrates what seemed like a fairy tale to someone becomes reality. Therefore, this is a really important task even though it may be needed somewhere from a marketing perspective, but not only that. And I want to say that it is not necessary to wait the full three to five years until uh, the moment, Pasha, that you say something will take to the air. In fact, we will soon demonstrate how we launch the stratospheric apparatus, both manned and unmanned, with a direct communication channel, for example, with recordings on certain media followed by landing and retrieval. However, this is the most basic direct communication. Broadcasting is a slightly more complex task, but it is also possible. Changing airflows, we will show how we will or will not do it. We will demonstrate an unmanned device, showing the same thing that Google Loom did, which is the ability to adapt to the winds. We will show small airship devices that will fly in automatic modes. They will be really small, with a payload capacity of up to 40 kilograms. We do not consider them as serious devices. A serious device is either for six people or has a capacity of two tons. That is a serious device. As for these devices, we are already working on them. Our design team has already been working on this, uh, and it's conditional because we want to. So we will be showcasing and discussing all of this. And the nearest serious device, which is the flying yacht, can take off not even in three years, not even in two and a half. In two and a half to three, this is conditionally the conduct of flight tests.
This is when all the documentation is collected, all the methodologies are written. In general, we are officially ready for this. Unofficially, we can lift this device in a year. Yes, definitely great in a year. In a year, everyone will see that it's like, wow, no way, it's taking off, it's really taking off. And it is not necessary to build your own hangar for this. It can be done in any other one, and most likely it will be, because it is interesting for us. The faster we lift the device into the air, the better and cooler we are. Of course, official procedures no, and obtaining certifications will be mandatory because this is business. However, from a technological standpoint, we must demonstrate and prove that we can do this. Yes, I have already read some questions, and we have partially answered them just now. By the way, there are a lot of questions. I noticed there are many questions. So let's do it this way. I will now, in principle, talk about what we are doing and the timelines we are working on. Now I will talk about what is being offered, what participation proposed to investors watching this broadcast, and then we will move on to your questions. So please keep writing them. What is being offered to investors? That is, we have already mentioned today that a total amount of $100 million needs to be raised. Indeed, this amount is inclusive of the referral rewards and everything else. It is planned to achieve this within three to five years. We have our financial plan, which we approved at the start of the process. It spans three years, and we expect it to take three to three and a half years. So five years is a pessimistic scenario for us. And seeing how our first project, Sovelmash, is currently being financed, we are confident in these rates. We understand what needs to be done, and we see strong support from both partners and investors. So this plan is more than realistic. Accordingly, these $100 million are divided into 20 stages of financing. At the moment, we are in the pre-launch stage, the preparatory phase. As you may have already guessed, if you are indeed an investor in the Sobelmash project, the investment conditions will definitely worsen at every stage. Today, investing is more profitable than, for example, at the first stage. Here is why. On the second and third, shares prices will furthermore increase additionally. Speaking about the distribution within the company, 50% of the created company will be allocated to all investors, as Fedor has already mentioned, while 51% remains with the team implementing the project. We have already talked about this today as well, in detail and at length. Today, the investor acquires shares of the company Solar Group, which is a significant and strategic move. After the company is fully funded and reaches its financial goals, these shares will be exchanged for shares of the company Nova. Well, at least that is what we are calling it now, but the name might change in the future. Therefore, those investors who join today have the opportunity to become co-owners of this business and accordingly to share in all the resulting opportunities for earning alongside the company. When you essentially own a part of a business, you can profit from its capitalization. Accordingly, you are acquiring a part of the company today when we are at the very beginning and the company needs funds. And accordingly, naturally, you can acquire a part of the company at one price. When the first airships appear, in three to five years, the initial profits, of course, will mean that the value and capitalization of this company will be worth entirely different amounts. And you will be able to earn by selling your share, which you are acquiring now. If you do not sell your share and keep it, then as a co-owner, as a shareholder of this company, you can indeed expect to receive dividends. Approximately 50% or 49% of the money that will be distributed as dividends will be shared among the investors. This is quite a significant amount. Today we discussed that 1 billion is approximately three years of the company's profit which I believe is $370 million a year. $370 million a year as $370 million a year as the company will be able to generate this considering only the construction of two hangars and the serial production and sale of two types of airships. We are not even considering external business projects here as Fedor mentioned, such as those with Roscosmos and other companies. 
this is another additional profit. Right now, we are talking about the minimum, so to speak, execution of the project. However, of course, when new airships appear, as we mentioned, either through financing in the form of crowdfunding or from a major investor, these will be separate external business projects without diluting the shares of current investors. The company will definitely receive new Ellingen, which produces new airships, gains additional profit, and profits will significantly increase. Of course, those investors who have invested today, even without investing further or making any efforts in creating the future types of airships we discussed today, will still receive this profit because they are investing specifically in the parent company, in the main company that will generate profit across various different directions within this project and the Nova company. Accordingly, it is currently planned that the company Nova will issue approximately 1 billion shares, half of which will be distributed among the investors so that we can sell these 500 million shares, which will be equivalent to 500 billion shares of the company Solar Group that you are receiving today. It is these shares that you will exchange for shares of the company Nova after the completion of the financing and the stock issuance of this company. What are the investment conditions we have today regarding discounts and stages? Today, as I mentioned, as you know, we are currently in the pre-launch phase. In the pre-launch phase, our average discount is approximately around 1,000. At the same time, as soon as the first stage begins, that very discount will already be an average of 500. In other words, investing today at the pre-launch stage is still unclear, with a lot of uncertainties. The legal framework is not fully prepared. The website is not ready. And there are many questions that can only be answered by joining the webinar. Not everyone attends. Today, if you indeed take this step, you will receive the very best investment circumstances because it is precisely this that justifies the potential risk you are taking on today. Those people who will invest in the coming months when the pre-launch phase is already over will not have such an opportunity. As part of the pre-launch phase, we plan to raise an amount of around $1 million today. So somewhere around September, maybe October, such an opportunity will still be available. On the other hand, we are also discussing reducing this amount so that it is under a million dollars. Therefore, no one can currently provide guarantees or specify clear timelines for how long the pre-launch phase will last. Therefore, if you like the project and see potential in it, it is better not to postpone this investment. On one hand, you will definitely, indeed, definitely secure these investment conditions for yourself. On the other hand, you understand that the project currently needs funding at this particular point in time. Of course, he is extremely interested in having the funds come in today because a huge number of very important tasks will be accomplished today. This includes hiring the first employees and renting office spaces. This is everything essentially needed to lay the crucial foundation for this important project. So a lot depends on you here. I will re-emphasize what I mentioned in the last webinars. The investment packages you are currently taking today at the pre-launch stage cannot be increased. They can only be increased during the pre-launch phase. Therefore, if you took a small package today, thinking that you would indeed increase it in about six months, Unfortunately, that simply won't be possible here. If you are confident in the project today, if you plan to invest a large sum, hoping for an increase, many are hoping for this, looking at our previous project where such an opportunity existed, then here that opportunity is not available. Therefore, I recommend taking exactly the investment package that you initially planned for yourself. This is also very important because later you will come and ask for an increase, but it will no longer be possible to do it before that. Please note for all partners that in order to receive referral rewards within the new project, you need to create a small and concise marketing plan. 
I would like to draw your attention to the fact that it is important to note that a marketing plan is absolutely necessary in order to successfully and effectively receive referral rewards specifically from those clients and investors of yours who were registered in the personal account before August 7th, that is before the start of the current new investment project. If you register someone today, you will receive the full amount of referral rewards. There are simply no restrictions here. But if you want to benefit from the old structure, which, by the way, fully retains all its connections, as we promised you, you need to take a series of small actions. You need to make a repost. There is some news there. Yes, you can find it on the landing page dedicated to airships in your personal account. You need to take an investment package with a nominal value of $2,000. You need to make an actual payment of $500 which can be within the same $2,000 package, and then fulfill one of the three conditions that you see on the screen now. Either three investors in the first line at approximately $500 each with such an investment, either approximately 10 investors each with investments of $50, or relieve yourself from working with your first line and simply invest $10,000 personally. I won't dwell on this for long, as all the conditions are detailed in the personal account on the landing page. Just remember, until you, as partners, complete the marketing plan, you will not receive referral barriers from your old investors and partners within the new Zeppelin project. Please note that you do not see any accruals, so you do not even know how much money has been issued at the moment. Therefore, I advise the partners who plan to work on this project to implement the marketing plan as quickly as possible in order not to miss out on income. Regarding the starting positions, we believe that this project will indeed be financed even faster and will be even more prominent than the previous Sovelmash project in terms of financing speed because we are starting from completely different starting positions, in our honest opinion. Currently, we have a very large audience with more than 500,000 registered clients in our personal account. And even based on the activity that exists today, we see that in principle, even this audience would be enough for us to be funded for the next one to two years. Therefore, in principle, we could do nothing. But since we do not actually want to engage only the existing audience, we are currently preparing a huge amount of materials, websites, social media introductions, presentations. Even this presentation that you have in front of you is temporary. And even these webinars that we are conducting now are all preliminary work for the webinars that we will have, which will be fully developed, of course. This new audience will allow us to confidently finance this project. And together with you, I am sure that we will succeed here. You can scan the QR code to access the landing page, view the current investment packages, payment plans, terms, and learn more about the marketing plan in detail. Friends, today you have a unique opportunity to truly support a very interesting, incredible, and exciting, innovative project that is emerging here with us in Russia. Now, once again, due to the global situation, many have started to pay attention to how important it is for Russia to have its own technologies when the country can provide for itself in various areas. And of course, airships are one of those areas that can develop both the economy of the country and from the perspective of accomplishing various tasks in a more understandable economic way, as well as from the standpoint that a large technological company is emerging in Russia, which has the potential for development worldwide. And today you can not only help, I would even say not help, but here it practically all depends on you, how quickly this company will get back on its feet, but also earn alongside it by acquiring a part of this business. So friends, such opportunities are extremely rare. With that, I suggest we move on to questions. There are many questions. 
Fedor, while I was talking, you probably already looked at the questions, but we can, you know, do it this way. I can, for example, read the questions and you can answer them so that we save time on this. Let's do it. You'll read and I'll respond. Keep it under 10 minutes. I don't want to fall behind schedule in two hours. Well, we probably won't manage it in 10 minutes, but let's give it a try. Let's quickly go through there as best as we can. And I initially opened questions on the official YouTube channel of the new generation airships. So here is the first question. Why was Augur unable to make a profit when it was involved with airships? Augur was able to earn money and he earned from all the devices he produced. You can watch the webinar that took place last Thursday. There are detailed stories, starting from the first device to the latest one. They succeeded in everything. They were commercially viable. The fact that Augur has dispersed is more about human, so to speak, relationships, personal desires and goals in essence. In general, Augur was commercially successful and viable as a whole. Moving on. They are inquiring about the source from which we will obtain helium. Additionally, they want to know the exact quantity of helium required to fill a mass of 10 tons. How much uh, helium is needed for this purpose? Helium should be sourced in our country, in Russia, if it is for the state of our country or the nearest foreign countries, or if it is for devices intended for other countries. They can fill it there too if they have their own helium. Helium is not a problem at all right now. In our country, it is even being scaled up. The extraction, storage, and other aspects involve cubic meters in the tens of thousands. And even for the production of helium, the logistical component is crucial for the helium producer, particularly regarding how to sell this helium to other countries. There is a developed project for transporting helium in Dewar vessels using airships, specifically to countries in Asia, and to other destinations. If we provide them with this service, then I definitely think we can absolutely take helium in exchange for our work. I will drop the information about cubic meters in the chat on Telegram. It's all there in general. Yes, if you are following the project, you have probably already found everything and familiarized yourself with it. If you are not following and did not find it, then you are not in this chat on Telegram. You need to join the chat on Telegram. It is most likely in the description of this video. I will duplicate the next two cubic meter devices there today. Next, the MI-8 helicopter costs between 14.5 and 17.5 million dollars. How much will your airship cost? From 20 to 30 and the cost is cheaper than my 8. The selling price depending on various factors and conditions in the market, functions in the market. If it's some kind of airship for personal use with an interior space, it could easily cost around 30. In our Telegram group, I think I shared a video about how much people buy their private planes for. The prices are astronomical. We can provide a person with even more space. In general, I replied that yes, the cost for something like that is the same or lower, around 20 to 30. Furthermore, if sanctions are imposed, could something happen to production and investors? What sanctions will be imposed? On the company itself? For now, we have a country. I liked one joke. Naturally, it is a joke. And the sanctions have indeed had a real impact both in one direction and the other. But the joke is that Russia has put the sanctions package into a package of packages, and this is the reality we are currently facing. There is nothing to worry about. The world hasn't collapsed, but Instagram has been turned off. It is clear that problems with sensors have arisen in the high-tech field, but there are parallel imports everywhere. The world is moving on. New marketplaces are opening while these are closing. If our company falls under sanctions, how could that happen?
Everything is arranged in such a way that the airship will be made from components that are either from our market or from markets that are friendly towards us. Most likely, if we make it onto the list of functional companies, we will just become even cooler. So that's wow. We'll all be happy and running around. Has your company made it onto the sanctions list? Well, yes, and I even more so think it is obvious that I believe now probably all rational people who are launching some kind of technological business understand that they may fall under sanctions. So initially, including us, we think about this. But what is the most important thing? The brains cannot be sanctioned. These are the very people, the engineers, who can launch these airships. So I think, yes, we will sort this out. And by the way, a few comments regarding the idea that someone will squeeze something out, the British will squeeze it out and so on. I want to say that, no, we are not afraid of being squeezed out by the British or anything else. I can say that similar to the previous project, everyone said they won't let you, they won't allow you, the oil lobby, electric engines. As you can see, everything worked out. You try your best and everything works out as banal as it may seem, but that's how it works. And there's nothing that can be prohibited here anymore. They also advise that you should buy shares of Gazprom because, as they say, if your project takes off, Gazprom produces helium in Orenburg, which we will need. Well, that's fine. As you, Pasha, always say, risks need to be diversified. If you invest in airships, helium will soar at Gazprom like the stocks. Therefore, yes, buy Gazprom shares. A sound piece of advice. It is recommended to take a prepayment from the Arabs, which can be useful for financing. As for the questions, can vacuum be used instead of helium or hydrogen? It is not possible. It is not possible. They are writing about employees for production. When you start hiring, I would like to apply for a job with you. Where should I inquire? Is it possible for those who want to work in the future company? Yes, you can work in the future company if you want to. You need to either write to me privately or to any employee of Solar Group with a note like forward to Fedor or Sergei. We will have a conversation, yes. And why not? We are all for it. Our door is open. If you are from the right industry with the necessary competencies and a desire to help and work, then of course, yes. Yes, by the way, indeed, everyone who wants to help in any way, get a job or offer something. Maybe you have land that we need. You can even do it this way. You can write to technical support on our website or in your personal account and just write that it should be passed on to Sergei Semyonov, for example and they will definitely pass it on, or to Fedor Konstantinov. The website states that at the start, it was 2.5 million, and you say it is down to 1 million. Yes, it was originally 2.5 million, but it has been reduced to 1 million, that's true. And I say that this amount may be reduced further. So with YouTube, the questions have ended from the official channel, and I am moving to vcontacta. So, how many flights can hydrogen or helium in an airship provide? An infinite number of flights can simply be refueled. There is a certain percentage of leakage, which is measured in units of percentage while maintaining the integrity of the envelope, with a leakage rate of 1% per month. You can refuel it and fly comfortably. It's more complicated with hydrogen, but easier with helium. They very soon started filming a detailed video. It will be a large, comprehensive overview piece about modern, innovative envelopes that are gas-tight for hydrogen and helium. We will actually work with all the shells at their production sites. We will conduct tests, show everything, and explain everything concisely through science so that there are no more such questions. In general, it is not a problem to hold helium-hydrogen with modern technologies, and I don't know where this idea even comes from. Most likely, he will be releasing this hydrogen and helium almost like a colander, and you will go bankrupt on his refuels. No, that's not the case at all. Of course, there will be refueling now. This will all be part of its maintenance.
And the maintenance of the entire apparatus has its own cost, just like the maintenance of a car. It's where you change the oil, brake pads, and various technical fluids and do some other things. And the cost before filling it with helium will not even reach approximately 10% of the significant cost of this maintenance. These are not the expenses that should be taken into consideration. Here's the hangar. By the way, sorry for you to post the video where you are flying on the airship. I can duplicate it. It is available in our Telegram chat in the pre-launch. You can easily click through the pinned messages to find it. It's definitely somewhere in the first few days, in the first week. I can upload it again if it's important. So the hangar that was shown in the video, I understand, is in Kirzak. Why don't you want to just build in it? Look, we can build the first, the very unofficial facility right there in Elling, which is located in Kirzak. But we need to construct... This Elling was created for specific tasks, specifically those that were set before the team of developers at that time. We have a provisional size of the flying yacht there in the region of Lazy, approximately, give or take. And we can actually assemble the first unofficial facility there, fly on it, and so on. But still, Elling is like an assembly production. It's more like an assembly and repair shop for technical maintenance and other services. It should be modern, like, you know, saying that there is a service. For some car like Porsche, where it needs to be brought, and there is equipment suitable for Porsche, trained personnel, and they handle everything calmly. Now the question is, can a Porsche be serviced in the guy's garage there? Yes, it definitely can. Absolutely no problem. However, in order to service the subsequent Porsches, it is still better to create a proper service center. Among the options you mentioned regarding land, I also suggest considering the Far Eastern hectare as an option. So, regarding the questions, yes, can you comment on that? Yes, I am recording what I need to send in Telegram. This is, it turns out, the volumes of gases in the devices. How many cubic meters do they occupy? Duplicate the video of how we fly. And a video from the blogger. Come on, Pasha, what time do we have left? We've already passed almost two hours. It's six o'clock. Well, come on, let's quickly answer the question. I think it will take five to ten minutes, and then we'll be done. So, regarding the question, how much could a yacht for six people cost approximately? Kurban Baran. How much something can cost and how much it will cost are two different figures. One is actual, the other is fantastic. If we measure it in cars, for instance, let's take a good luxurious car. The first yachts will be produced under the Aorus brand. And if we take Aorus itself, it is a car with a price and a conditional buyer. Approximately, for example, the Arabs also liked it, and even now production is moving there, and there are panic sentiments. They closed the Aorus production in Russia. It's over. Make Aorus yachts. No, everything will only get better because, in general, because Aorus has its own price and how do you think, how many Aorus cars would it take to be equivalent to the cost of one flying yacht? Please share your answers in the Telegram group, which is very active, with a note about the Aorus price. And I will then respond in the same telegram group with the actual cost in terms of cars. I am asking in which city the design bureau will be located. It is in Moscow, right? Could there be difficulties with today's JD air carriers? No, 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 nobody will share any bread with anyone. I am saying this purely as an addition to what is available. For this industry to start, 
It should not take away someone else's bread. It needs to develop and move forward for decades. This is a very broad series of facilities. And for some reason, we established Norilsk a long time ago. And to this day, no railways or anyone else, except for airplanes, have laid roads there. There are tasks where no one is claiming this bread at all, and it is generally impossible to take it. We will first address these tasks by complementing what is already available and expanding the economic opportunities for the entire country, as well as for other countries. In the future, yes, there will be a struggle among the industries when we are already big and strong, but that will be wonderful. For now, at this particular moment in time, it's solely and exclusively about harmonious coexistence. So will the Arabs help invest in the project? They really want to, yes. And we are preparing a legal structure to avoid being absorbed by large capital. So will there be leasing, renting of airships, as I understand? Well, yes, indeed. Again, an idea that actually arose during a live broadcast. Someone will lease these airships. Maybe we will, maybe someone else. It's unknown. Everything, so to speak, the tools are starting to come together at one construction site, as they say. We are living... Why not? So, they are asking why a limited liability company and not a joint stock company. Well, Vladislav, the situation here is the same as with Sobol Mash. Yes, that currently an LLC is faster, more convenient, and more manageable than a joint stock company at the very beginning because in a joint stock company having several co-founders who will also be here including in the llc it is necessary to constantly hold meetings of these founders and to run all decisions through all co-founders in general this structure is very bureaucratic but it allows for the management of a large joint stock company when you have dozens, hundreds, or thousands of co-owners in the business. When your business effectively has 5, 10 co-owners at the moment, and it will be like that because instead of thousands of investors, there will be one solar group. In this case, legally, it is one co-owner. The LLC form is much more manageable. People simply have the perception that an LLC is something cheap and easy. An LLC costs nothing. But a joint stock company is something serious. In fact, creating a joint stock company is not much more expensive than an LLC. Therefore, it is important to understand that these are just different forms of legal entities. If we understand that a joint stock company is what we need, we will create a joint stock company. Everything is possible. They are also asking about combining packages specifically if the $1,000 and $2,000 packages can be merged into one $5,000 package. Currently, it is possible to do this at the pre-launch stage. If you want to increase your package at the pre-launch stage now, but you already have several packages purchased, you can actually combine them into one and increase that one package. This can be done. This is the last place to read the questions. I agree, Fedor. We have been on air for a very long time, and it's not very good to hold webinars for long. On the other hand, leaving questions unanswered is not very good either, so I think it is necessary to respond to the most interesting ones, at the very least. Yes, I quickly wanted to add something very important. Why is it a limited liability company, LLC, and not a joint stock company? We are, in general, in our country, in the current realities, and no one starts a so-called startup as an LLC. We can call it a startup, a revival of the industry, etc. This is not how we do things here. In America, for example, it is clear that this is done as a joint stock company, initially not on the stock exchange, but somehow shareholders appear conditionally. There, this mechanism works. Here, the mechanism is just starting from reality, and that's all. The longest part of the process is obtaining the certification, isn't it? Especially when you are dealing with the dirigible, which requires a lot of paperwork and approvals. 
The longest part is the certification, the journey itself. In order to certify the facility and produce it in series in three years, you must comply with the regulations from the very first day of the company's existence, doing everything according to the standards. And this process itself is long. You could say that certification begins on the very first day of the company's operation. We can, yes, build a dirigible in a year, take off, but it's unlikely that we will be shot down. Of course, we might get scolded, but that's not a fact either. But in order to obtain the certificate in the end, the procedure from the first day and upon completion of the tests is necessary. The flight tests themselves will take place in less than a year. Initially, various commissions will come to check what software you are using, what kind of people are involved, and their educational backgrounds. In order for these computers, these servers, to be on the balance sheet of this company, and if your company has a license, to obtain a license, you must comply. There is a lot to go through before the certification tests for obtaining the certificate. Plus, it can take a year, or maybe faster. Watch the previous webinar. Boris Alexandrovich, our expert, was just talking in detail about the certification process there. Next, again about the prices. Do you have any information at hand? What is the price of the 10 tonner listed in the plan? Let me also send all of this in Telegram. I have it on hand, but please add me on Telegram if you haven't already. Uh, sorry, it's such a manipulative tool. I'm recording all the questions, and right after the webinar, I'll start sending them out. What is the cost price of transporting 10 tons through the sky conditionally? Ton kilometer transportation, ton kilometer. The question is recorded as follows. What is the price for 10 tons as stated in the plan? Well, probably the cost price. It's noted how much to sell it for. We've discussed how much to sell it for. Its cost price is available, but no point in revealing it yet. It's plus or minus like the MI-8 helicopters. Uh-huh. So, will you be engaged in cargo or passenger transportation? Well, the answer here is yes, we will. There was a lot of talk about this today. They are asking, where is the link in the chat in Telegram? I sent it. Yes, we talked about it. Um, but in any case, remember that if you don't know how to find a social network we are discussing, or a chat, or if you don't know how to contact Fyodor, me, Sergei Seonov, or someone else, you can always write to technical support and say, I have this request, please give me the chat. Where can I find technical support, Pavel? Explain. Yes, technical support is in our personal account. There is always a little thing hanging at the bottom that says we are online. You need to register in our personal account. There is likely a registration link somewhere near this video. Or you can simply type Solar Group into a search engine and find it that way. Once you go to your personal account, don't be alarmed. There are currently two projects and you need to click on the airship icon to access the section you wanted. One more question regarding the lifespan. How many years can an airship serve, similar to a car? It all depends on who manages the enterprise, marketers, managers, or engineers. When engineers were in charge of Mercedes, the Mercedes cars were millionaires, now managers and designers are in control and everything is falling apart on the go. Fifteen years are laid down for their operation, which is more than enough. That is, there will be a cycle of 10-ton vessels, they need to be produced, and then updated every 15 years. It is generally laid down like this. It can be less. It can be more. It all typically depends on engineering talent and the style of managing the enterprise. Is there a question accessing the exchange bridge? Is it planned? Yes, it is planned. This is one of the ways. One of the ways for investors who are investing today and will receive shares in the future to sell those shares. Therefore, the Moscow Exchange is an excellent tool for such a task. Yes, we can consider not only going public on the Moscow Exchange, we can also list on different exchanges in various countries. The international project is planned, and the broader we go, the more interesting it will be for all of us. Yes, moreover, a company can be valued differently on different exchanges. Therefore, 
wherever the best valuation is given, that is where one can essentially exit, some companies immediately turn to low exchanges. Today, this is also quite accessible. So, regarding the questions, besides the creation of airships, will the company be accepting orders for a hangar for them? Well, naturally, the infrastructure for airships is an integral part of them. Since we will build our own, we can also construct similar ones based on the same project independently. We have the capability for this for third-party clients. Again, I will reiterate that an airship can be stored outside in any climatic conditions. This is all discussed with the client. If they say they are in a hot tropical environment, we will develop it for them. If it's in the north, it can be adapted for both environments and it can be stored outside in either case. But yes, the question is where the nearest garage will be for it to pass through. Will it be convenient for them to fly in from somewhere in Africa to us? Well, why not travel? On one hand, on the other hand, if a couple or three of them have accumulated, they can afford to set up an Elling nearby since they have all bought the airship. And most likely, most probably, they will acquire them as an additional feature to the airship itself. So yes, the company will build parallel Ellings. And the staff should be fully and completely prepared from that side or the staff of a specific company already there. This is all also commercial and involves various aspects. Yes, they write that a small amount of funding is mentioned. Is such an amount really enough to launch this project? Please note that our task at this current stage is not to create a new rechargeable energy industry at this point. At the first stage, our task is to earn from the first two commercial units and then everything else. Therefore, the project is very ambitious and large. A new industry is indeed being created but it is being established by first earning from something simple and then from something complex. A quite adequate budget. This is essentially an industry MVP that is indeed a minimum viable commercial unit, technological of course. The money we are collecting for this project is the minimally possible cell, so to speak, an organism that can further engage in self-development and grow into something larger. The entire project, if considered, will cost much more with all the stratospheric 200 tonners, numerous mailings, operating companies, and so on. However, this small cell will be able to ensure its growth to such scales. I say, it is possible investments will be made in the future, but the cost is the cost of the MVP. Will the criteria for arrivals at the stages be outlined? Yes, they will be. They will be outlined. Is there a properly formatted business plan and where can it be viewed? There are business plans. We will make modifications to them right now. I have already hinted once that I can post it in the Telegram channel in its current form. Currently. But later when we make the adjustments this will already spread everywhere and you will say why do they not match? We will then explain to you what we have already announced to everyone, that the first stage is the pre-launch, it is not the launch. We are here to show you how the project starts before it has actually launched. In other words, previous projects went through this stage without publicity. We are currently finalizing it. There is a business plan. I don't really see the point in sharing it right now, just wait a little longer. And this autumn, the business plan will be fully stamped. Again, this is the first iteration, but it is already more detailed than what is currently available, although even now it consists of several kilograms of paper with detailed graphs, figures, and mathematical economic models. They already exist, but right now, this was again built at the initial stage when one specialist is working on their own, another is working on their own, a third is working on their own, and so on. So now we gather everyone in one place, sit down at the table once again, discuss everything again, recalculate everything, while looking each other in the eyes, shake hands, sign, and this business plan becomes solid and public. 
Thus, they are asking to open the investment increase of packages, which we discussed today. We will definitely open the opportunity to increase the package that you took at the pre-launch. I would like to remind you that once you transition to the first stage, it will not be possible to increase it. You do not need to wait for that button. You can simply contact technical support and they will increase your package for you. So let's get to the questions. There was another question just now. So if I, as a member of the Club 1000, enter the airship at the second stage, will the share prices be the same as at the pre-start or does this not apply to the current stage? Look, we have the Club 100,000 and yesterday a corresponding update was released, which is now, so to speak, being renamed to the club. Within this club, there is now an opportunity to join the 100 projects of Duyanov's engines. Now it is specifically the Club 100 and 1000 Solar Group. And within the framework of this club, there is now an opportunity for 100 innovative investors to join Club 100 and 1000 investors to join Club 1000. But this is about the next generation airship project. Therefore, if you are in the Solar Group Club, but let's say you are a strawberry who invested in the 2.0 engine project, then this does not apply to the new project. Accordingly, to have the conditions for strawberries, you need to invest in the new project. The airship has a significantly large sail area. How is the problem of controlling it addressed in conditions of bad weather or wind? And effectively, Problems are currently being solved by engineers at the stage of creating the facility. Engineers have now not only learned to fight against the wind, but we also had Voyager traveling beyond the solar system, and people are flying to space on the ISS. Submarines are swimming, and everything is happening on the planet. This is all engineering of the 21st century, coping with all current challenges as best as it can. If we consider that a hundred years ago, the Hindenburg easily flew from Europe across the Atlantic to North America, facing any weather conditions over that ocean. And the Hindenburg was enormous. The first little yacht of Distatonic is nowhere near the Hindenburg. Modern technological advancements in the field of aviation and maritime engineering. And then they managed with it. There were no problems with any steaminess, and Hindenburg did not fly alone. There were hundreds of devices of different sizes in Germany, also in England, France, and the Russian Empire. Back then, we managed with that, and now these problems will certainly not exist. There were no aerodynamic tunnels to test everything, nor were there any methods for machine calculations of all these things. There are no parameters from non-satellite data regarding the winds, where they are moving, in which layers or any special analytical instruments that could be on board for all these winds. In general, it has no sail capability. It's clear that if he gets a gust from the side, he'll be blown sideways. But centuries ago, people managed without all the things we have now, and handling it is not a problem at all. Up to 15 meters per second, takeoff and landing are laid out directly in the technical specifications of the device. Its ground parking can handle 35, 40, meters per second, and it can be stored outside without needing to be brought into a hangar, although at such winds some hangars can be torn away. In general, there are no problems with this. Well, regarding the questions, they say that if a major investor comes in, everyone else is a curse word. I don't know why Alex writes that way. On the contrary, if a major investor joins the project today, well, some people will be unlucky because they simply didn't manage to invest in the project. But those investors who managed to enter the project before large capital arrives here will benefit. We still won't let large capital into the parent company. It will remain on the crowd. Large financial capital can enter and account for the crowd investor only if it invests through a personal account in the follow group. Well, yes, he took it and closed the entire setup through his personal account. He is just the same kind of crowd investor, simply with equal shares. Should we not accept this payment? In any other cases where investment implies not a personal account, 
but rather a situation where I am a large capital investor entering your company. In this case, the legal structure fully protects crowd investors and we will not allow large capital to enter the parent company. Yes, of course, we have talked about this many times as well. And I remember this fear does not arise for the first time among investors, that a large investor will come and we will be thrown out. I assure you that will not happen. It would be very foolish to act this way from all points of view. Therefore, if you manage to invest and acquire shares in the company, they will remain with you forever until you sell them yourself. Well, here's a question. I don't know why there is only one employee at JSC Aerostatica according to the 2023 data. Because JSC Aerostatica does not engage in commercial activities, it is non-profit and they do not hire anyone as there is no money to pay salaries. The company is very old. It has been established there for many years, approximately two decades, about 20. It used to be profitable, but now it is not. Everything is, as usual, in general. And the last question, which is a bit haterish, but actually very interesting. Why does no one want to give money from large financial backers and investors? They want the maximum package once again, like at Duino. Why is it that everyone is getting it except Solar Group? The person seems to be asking why large investors don't give money to Solar Group while they do give it to someone else? Well, the first thing I would like to say is firstly, we have investors who have invested over a million dollars, so it cannot be said that we lack major investors, unless, of course, a million or one and a half million dollars is not considered money for you. Secondly, who else around the entire world is also being given it? Unfortunately, we attended a presentation by a company that has also recently gone public on the Moscow Exchange which is involved in space and is also from the technology sector. Maybe it's not worth talking about them. They are good guys. I only want to focus on the context of how they started their presentation. I liked it. They went out and said why we are attracting funds through the Moscow exchange from private investors. Because unfortunately, we do not have a venture market in Russia. Unfortunately, for some starting companies, I'm not talking about beginners in terms of novice entrepreneurs, but rather someone who is starting a new business. And it is technological, it has a foundation, it has patents, everything you want. But this business lacks any real estate backing or a capital of some kind with a charter of a billion. At least a billion rubles. No one is giving him a billion rubles. That's how it is with us. A loan is the same. You won't be able to take a billion on credit. And these technology companies, these teams of engineers, they just, Fyodor, you probably can tell me better what is happening with them. They are just sitting and... Know why? Some people run around all sweaty and everything works out for them. There are such diamonds, but for the most part, it's really just hammering away. Thresholds in various funds of different business angels highlight the fact that the venture market is essentially dead at such early stages. However, as Posh said, we are also involved in ventures. We were brought a million dollars for this type of financing. When we talk about some venture funding, where nothing exists yet and everything is being created, so to speak, before your eyes at this stage. There is either no such capital in Russia or it is very, very scarce. Even the state does not want to take risks until you find an investor somewhere. This is how we have structured it. We have already proven that such projects can be financed through crowdfunding. You see it all yourself how it is born, how it comes together. And this is a great tool that will help this company to establish itself in England. And you will see it for yourself. I hope you will also participate. Well, that's all for now. The questions are not over yet. I won't read it again right now, probably because I am paying for everyone. Already at the cost, we broke the record for duration. 
Yes, but I also want to note and express my joy that today there were quite a few viewers, many questions on all platforms, both on YouTube and VK. This is encouraging. It shows that people are interested in the project, they come to our presentations and ask a lot of questions. Thank you very much for your support and please join our webinars. There will be a lot of interesting content. The next one will be on Friday and will be dedicated not to basic information, but rather to news about what has happened. As always, by tradition, there will be a continuation of the introduction to the technical team and the implementers. This Friday, there will also be a guest, so stay tuned for announcements to find out who will be there and what we will discuss. If you haven't watched the webinar from the previous Friday, which I have mentioned, several times during this webinar you should check it out, it's really cool. We discussed certification, Augur, his past life, and aerostatics devices, so take a look. And still, join us on Telegram. Yes, come in, follow us on VK, YouTube, search for us. We are building all of this. We are just at the very beginning, so support is needed. Yes, support is definitely needed. So I am confident that we have it and will continue to have it. This can be wrapped up. Uh, thank you all very much for watching. I remind you to definitely like repost and send this link to a friend of yours who doesn't know about our project yet, maybe in some investors chat. These webinars are specifically designed for you to learn about this information, share it with others and send the link further. Please make sure to do this. That's all for now. Come on Friday. The link will be in our official sources. Goodbye everyone.